I'm not alone in this room. See, when I was 16 years old, I just got my license. And I went, I was at my girlfriend at the Times house in high school, and I was driving home from her house, and I was late as usual, and I was speeding, I mean going the speed limit, um, going home to make it home before curfew because I could not be late one more time, my parents said, otherwise they would take away my car. And I remember it was one of those nights where I was literally driving and it was one of the, it's the, like a night, have you ever had those nights, those of you who drive, where you're going home and all the lights are green? Like you're late for curfew and you're like, God, where, like where, I look up to the hills where, and where does my help come from? It comes from you, Lord. And it is one of those nights you are real and I'm driving down and it's all green lights and here we go. I'm like, finally, I'll finally for once be able to make it home before curfew and not get in trouble. And so I thought it was one of those nights. It was going, it was beautiful. It was miracles exist. And deep down far, I see this minivan about to turn right into my lane with all green lights. Now here's the thing that if you drive, and this is the, my biggest pet peeve when I'm driving, I get, turn into a monster sometimes when I drive. My wife gets so mad at me. But the smart and safe thing to do would be wait for, the, wait for me to pass this minivan and then the minivan would turn out into my lane. But no, that's not what happened. This minivan, and I'm speeding, remember, I mean speed limit, sorry, um, going down, and this minivan turns in front of me, and I had to slam on my brakes. Now, here's the thing. I was mad already. I was trying to beat it home, and I was, this, this lady should know that I'm trying to beat curfew home, um, but she didn't, and so she pulled out in front of me. I actually, it was actually very dangerous. I slammed on my brakes, and I swerved into the other lane, and for some whatever reason, she had to do that, and now I did what any normal person does when they just got cut off. Um, I swerve into the other lane and speed up because all I want to do is see her stupid face. Um, that cut me off, and so I drive up next. Don't tell me you don't do this, okay? That you just want to look at them and see who it is that just made you angry, and so I drive up next to this lady. Her window's down, and I'm like, oh, I roll down my window, and then I start yelling at her some things that I'm not going to repeat. It wasn't a very good thing. Don't do as I do. I'm just telling you what happened. And then I might, hit, might have or may not have given her some sort of gesture with my hands. Um, and I drove off and sped away. And here's the thing. I made it home on time. And it was great. This was a Saturday night, so next morning I get up and I go to, I'm a church kid. I grew up in the church. My mom was the, the preschool pastor. <laughs> just wait. Um, and so we... We get to church, and I led a small group of, 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 there were third graders at the time, and one of my third graders came up to me, and I was like, hey, Justin, one of my friends wants to join your small group, but his mom wants to meet you first. We, we met. <laughs> we, we met the night before uh, on, the, on, the, on the street, and she was driving a minivan. Um, and so uh, I, it was kind of like one of those things like, hey, oh. And I just walked away. I didn't even say anything. And so needless to say, he did not join my small group. Um, and it was, it was a really big I messed up. It was, it was one of those like defining moments where like, I, knew, I, was, I knew what to do. I knew that was the wrong thing to do, yet I messed up. See, I, I messed up pretty big time. See, even now, though, as a pastor, like, I mess up all the time. Like, I, can, we could be real in this place, right? We could, be, we could be real. Like, on the way over here, to give this message... I had another incident on the road. I'm not going to tell. That's a whole other story. But even, even more on a serious note, I, my family, my parents, after 35 years of marriage, they're going through this nasty divorce. And as a 31-year-old man, it still sucks. And I, rem I was sitting there, and I'm like literally going, about to give this message about obeying Jesus, and I'm just sitting there, sitting in my anger and bitterness because I just want to spew back these nasty things because my parents are just not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and it, it is making me angry. Can anyone relate to the frustration, to the things of, of trying to do things the, the right way? See, it's, for, for those of us who, who claim the name of Jesus, that, that Jesus actually calls us to this whole contrast living 
type of life. And for whatever reason, that we know the things that we're supposed to do. We know the things that we're supposed to say. We know the ways that, that Jesus calls us to live, yet we tend to rebel against those things. Because let's be honest, because it's a little bit easier sometimes. Because what Jesus actually calls us to is kind of hard. And the way that he, the way that he tells us to, to live is it's very different. I mean, let me tell you, even like, guys, I'm, I'm a pastor, and just because of life and frustrations, and there's moments where I ask myself, like, man, is, is this, like, worth it? Is this faith thing, the thing that I do for my living, like, is this worth it? Because sometimes, like, it's hard. Like, it's, sometimes it just, it sucks sometimes. And I find myself, like, is, is following Jesus and doing the things that he's called me to do, like, is is that actually like worth the time and the effort to go through all this whole thing? Because honestly, sometimes the easier thing is to give up. And see, for some people, obeying Jesus feels like the shackles that you have on right now. That they think that following Jesus actually is just a whole list of rules that has prevents them from doing the things that they want to do or keeps them from doing things that, you know, maybe they don't want to do. See, for, and they think that it's binding rather than freeing. See, when, when we step into the light of Jesus, when we understand what the gospel means and what, what he came to do on this planet, that he actually called us into a different way of living, and that when we step into that way of living, yes, for the most part, most of us, we understand that, yes, we get forgiven, uh, our shame and our guilt and the pain that comes along with that, uh, that, that seems to follow, follow us and the burdens that we bear that from our past and mistakes and our mess-ups, yes, that is forgiven, and that's only half of it. See, what other people don't understand that there's more, the second half of it is not just that you're forgiven of your sin and that you no longer have to carry the burden of those sins or the weight of the guilt or the shame. See, the other half of it is that you're, you're saved and that you're no longer shackled. But so many people who claim the name of Jesus, so many people who follow Jesus think and still live as if they are shackled because they think that it's a list of rules. Okay, see, here's the thing, that that's, that's just called religion. See, Jesus calls you to something more, that the other half of it, you're not only free from your sin, that you're also free to live in righteousness. Meaning that you are called to something different, and that many people, they live as if they are still shackled, even though they realize and acknowledge that Jesus is their Savior. See, we have to understand that Jesus is worth obeying. Like maybe you felt like me where you think this whole faith thing is a little hard. And you don't know if you want to put the effort that goes through following the way that Jesus called you to live. But here's, let me, let me just tell you that Jesus, he is worth obeying. See, whenever I've had the choice to choose my thing, to obey what I want to do, or to obey G Jesus, every time... Every single time that I've chosen to follow Jesus, it was worth it. And then in 1 John, when we're, as we continue in our passage, that, that, that he actually tells us how we are to live shackle-free. And I want to I walk through that with you tonight. And I want to talk about maybe a couple of reasons why we don't do this. Why we don't live in the freedom that Jesus offers us. Even though that we're shackle-free, we still live like it. I want to know why we do. And so in 1 John uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says, My dear children, he says, I, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone who does sin, we have an advocate. I want you to circle that word if you have a Bible, if you're taking notes. That we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What is an advocate? An advocate is, is a person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. So guess what this means? Is that we have someone in heaven, we have Jesus, who is for you. I don't know if you've heard this before, maybe you need to be reminded, but you have Jesus and he is for you. Meaning that when we leave this place and we go up into our Father in heaven, that Jesus is our advocate. When, when God, who, who we deserve the death and the wrath 
of what he brings is that Jesus says and stands in front of us and represents us in front of the Heavenly Father and says, hey, don't look at them anymore. You don't look at their mess ups. You don't have to look at the mistakes that they've done, the shame, the guilt. You don't have to look at that anymore. He says, look at me. I'm perfect. I'm holy. He is our advocate. He will speak up and stand up for you. So we have to know and walk confidently in this place that we have someone who is for us, who took the place of us, that we, that we get life, something that only Jesus deserved, that he re- replaced it with what we deserve, death. See, in verse 2, he says, uh, he, is atoning, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. See, the, the word atone, you see, we have to understand what this means because in order for us to continue to move on what it means to live in righteousness to live free of the shackles and the bondage that we seem to find ourselves in is that this word atone means to make amends that the bible that an atonement was was associated with man sin that back in the day if you read through the book of leviticus usually it's around the time honestly if we could be honest in this place it's around the whole year bible if I read the Bible in a year, I stop around Leviticus because it goes through all the laws and I get, I like sleep through and I read Leviticus 17,000 times because that's where I seem to live. Anyway, just me? Okay, that's fine. Um, so I, we, it talks about atonement and it talks about animal sacrifices that once a year that families would go to the temple and that they would sacrifice animals for the forgiveness of their sins. And that Jesus, what John is telling us that Jesus, that he is the atonement of our sins. The final atonement, meaning that there's a reason why we're not here at Biola sacrificing cows at the altar tonight, right? Praise Jesus on that, right? That Jesus was the atonement of our sins, the final sacrifice, that he has forgiven us of our sins in past, present, future. Continue in verse 3. See, it says, we know that we've come to know him. That if we keep his commandments, how do you get to, how do you know if you know Jesus? If you keep his commandments. That whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone who obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. That whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Ooh, that last line though. Ooh. Whoever claims to live in Jesus must live their life as Jesus. Did you, have you read the gospels? Have you seen how Jesus lived? Like, did you, do you know like why we have such a hard time with that? Do you know why we have such a hard time with, with Jesus living as the way that Jesus lived? Because Jesus was a living contrast. Everything about him was countercultural. Everything about him was opposite of what people thought that he was going to be. People thought back in the day that the Messiah was going to come down as a political and military ruler, but he came down as a servant. That people thought that he would bring people back, uh, the kingdom of Israel, back to its rightful place, but all he talked about was how the kingdom of God was near and it was coming. That people thought he was going to come down with a crown and take over the power, but instead he wore a crown of thorns so that we could end up having a crown in heaven when we leave this place and go into eternity when we choose to follow him. See, Jesus called his disciples back then, 2,000 years ago, to live a different life, and that same call is for us today. See, do you know, right, do you want to know, like, how, how do you know if how you're doing spiritually? Like, have you ever wondered, like, man, how am I doing at this whole, like, Jesus following thing? Here's a great litmus test. How well are you obeying his commandments? Like, do you actually do what he says? Here's a better question. When, someone's, when someone looks at your life, can they tell you're a follower of Jesus without you saying something to them? Like, if someone were to follow you around, would they be able to tell that there's something different about you? Like, have you ever wondered? I do, because I, I, I struggle with this sometimes. Have you ever wondered why we tend to not choose to obey Jesus? Like, why, why is it that, that deep down in who we are, 
we tend to rebel against Jesus rather than obey him. That many people live in shackles because they don't understand the freedom that Jesus brings and he offers when we simply obey him. See, if, if, if we know that Jesus changes lives and we know that living for him will actually be more freeing than restrictive and we choose to obey Jesus, yet we don't tell others about him, about this freedom. And if we look at life, like honestly, we can look at all of Jesus' commandments and we can choose pick and choose all the different commandments and we can see why we don't choose to follow them or why we choose to do some but not others but let's just pick a couple of areas and I would love and I think that we fall into these areas of why we choose not to obey Jesus and actually live in the freedom that obeying Jesus offers and I think there's a few reasons there's three there's three that I want to present to you that maybe this is where you fall into and you've fallen into this trap of not obeying Jesus number one it's this idea of complacency idea of complacency, meaning that you are okay with the status quo. You, meaning like, I'm okay with how things are right now. I have no desire to improve my relationship with Jesus. Have you ever like had the, have you ever answered something with like, meh? Like, it's like that. It's like a meh faith. Like, how's your faith doing? Meh. It's doing okay. Compla that's what complacency is. See, and here's the thing. I think we need to come to terms with reality. Let's just go with one commandment, and that is the Great Commission, to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's just take that one example, and let's kind of come to a reality of why we tend to not even obey that one, and it's this idea of complacency, and maybe you feel this as well. Because think about this, guys. You, when you're in school, when you go to school in the fall, you're going to be around people five days a week who do not know who Jesus is. That they're, you're literally surrounded by people who are spiritually dying. People who need Jesus, and so often we don't say a word to them, even though Jesus commands us to, to go and make disciples. And yet for some of us, me too, I'll be honest, we're numb to it. And we just kind of go about our days. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we will go another school year worrying about more, about finishing the year strong, more than where our best friends will spend eternity. See, I, I, know, this is, I know this is strong, and some of you are going, like, whoa, Justin, I liked you better when you were eating gross things. But this is what we have to understand. That this is so important that we have people in our lives that may not even that may not even know that they're bound in shackles. They might think that that's regular living, and we know how to set them free. We know someone who could set them free. And Jesus, on his last days on earth, gave us that great commission where he, he commands us to go out and make disciples. Where he says, I had died for them, I, I placed their sin on me so that they could live free. And so many people take the Great Commission and treat it as the great suggestion. Or they treat it as the great, if the opportunity presents itself. Or, I don't want to feel awkward, so if it comes up, maybe. I'll get it around to it one day. Complacency. That's why I think we sometimes, we don't follow the commands of Jesus. Second thing is comfort. If you think about it, this is why we don't step out and to, and to follow Jesus' commandment because I'm not going to lie to you, I love to be comfy. I wish I was wearing my comfy pants right now. I have comfy pants and slippers. They're like pillows. They're Uggs. They're delicious, right? They're not the boot Uggs, but they're slipper Uggs. And they're, uh, I want them on my feet right now. See, but here's the thing. When I go on vacation, I don't want to do anything. My wife, she wants to adventure. She wants to go out and about. And I'm like, man, I don't want to do that. I want to, my perfect vacation is to be comfortable. I want to be somewhere hot so I could sit in something cool. That's my perfect vacation. I want to go to a hotel and put on the robe. I, I, yes, I wear it. And I wear it to the free breakfast in the morning. My wife hates it. Um, I want to be comfortable. I love being comfortable. I have a spot in my house. It's the L in the corner of the couch. That's my spot. And it's comfy. And here's the truth. And I think we could be honest. It's uncomfortable to talk about Jesus sometimes. 
I get uncomfortable to talk about Jesus sometimes, and I'm a pastor with people. See, it's uncomfortable to invite people maybe to come to church or to bring up Jesus in conversations without kind of making it seem awkward. See, it's uncomfortable to try to explain to others why you don't do certain things or why you do do certain things because of your faith in Jesus. See, I was trying to figure out why. Why is this? And here's what I've come up with because I think it's true for me and I think it's true for many of you. I think that it's because we care more about what they think about us more than what Jesus wants to do in their life. Ugh. I, I really do. I think that we're so comfortable that we're afraid about what other people are going to think about us more than we care about what Jesus wants to do in their life. That we know people who are shackled. We know people who are still living in the dark, yet we're quiet. Because we care about the conversation that we're going to have. And, we, and we, what would happen if we'd be willing to get a little uncomfortable? See, we care about more what other people think about us. We care about our status. We care about that guy. or We don't want to be that girl or that guy or the goody two-shoes or that Jesus person. See, let me say something. Let me ask you something. What if someone's eternity could change on the other end of an awkward conversation? What if someone's eternity can change? on the other end of an awkward conversation. See, what if your best friend could meet Jesus and begin to chase things and to begin to desire things that matters, that actually matters, and, and that, that they get to spend their life with the purpose that only Jesus could give. See, full of hope and full of joy and full of life, that chasing the one thing that could actually satisfy their soul. But the one thing that is holding them back it's a conversation that we're not willing to have because we're not willing to get a little bit uncomfortable. But let's be honest. Are we not glad that Jesus was, be, was willing to get a little uncomfortable for us? Are we not glad that he was willing to go to the cross and suffer for us on our behalf? That he was willing to get uncomfortable so that we could remove the shackles in our life and begin to live a life of freedom and righteousness? comfort, man. It, ke it keeps us. It keeps us from obeying Jesus the way that he calls us to live. And the third thing is, I think it's selfishness. Selfishness keeps us from obeying Jesus. If you, I, I really do believe nothing will kill the move of God in your life than selfishness. Nothing will kill it more than us choosing to be selfish. And here's the thing. Here's a question that, and it's a big question. I hate this question. But it's a question that we have to ask. Am I willing to give up my plans for his plans? That's a, it's not only a big question, but that's like, a, that's like a daily question. That's something that we have to do every single... I hate this question. You know why? My plans are awesome. They are. I make great plans. Guess who everyone looks to when we make plans? This guy, right? I make all the plans. Everything that we do is great. I know the plans that I have for my life are freaking amazing. I know exactly what I want to do. I know where I want to go. I know where I want to eat, ladies, okay? I want to know. Don't tell me it's not true. My plans are exciting. The comfort level that I've designed for my life is pretty top-notch. I love it. It's pretty sweet. But here's the tension. All my plans, all the natural plans for me comes, stems from my selfishness. That I, I'm a very selfish person, and I'm guessing that I'm not the only one, am I? Any other selfish people in here? No? Okay, that's fine. Three of you? Liars. Okay. Um, here's the thing. Is, let me give you a couple examples. And this is just this week. I'm not perfect. This is just this week. This week, I went to Chick-fil-A. The, the holy chicken, Okay. I get out of my car, and across the parking lot, I see a bus full of old people from a senior living place get out of their car. I ran to the door before them because I didn't want to wait behind that line. You know what I'm saying? That's, what, that's the selfishness. That, the other night, my wife and I went out to dinner, and we shared uh, this steak. Like, we got, like, this steak dinner uh, thing, and we split it, and I had the waiter cut it in half when they brought it out and so they brought it out on two separate plates and I naturally took the bigger piece and my wife was like whoa 
what are you doing? And I was like, I, like I'm taking the, the piece. She's like, you took the bigger one, though. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And she's like, that's so rude of you. And I was like, oh, like but okay, well, what would you have done? And she's like, I would have given you the bigger piece. And I was like, well, I already have it. So there you go. <laughs> like, that, that's just this week. I'm a, so, my guess, though, that I'm not the only selfish person in this room. That we all have something like that. But here's a, th- here's a cool thing. Is that my, I'm not as selfish as I used to be. But as someone who's following Jesus, man, like I'm learning more and more about and realizing my selfishness about how I could learn to release my plans for his plans and for what Jesus has for me. See, I'm also, you know, and, and I'm also learning, and this is, this is really cool, that when I surrender my plans for his plans, that God supports it and he blesses it. He rewards those decisions that in Matthew 6, it says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. Keep that verse up there just for a second because I want to break this down because this is what he's talking about. He says, seek, so desire, his, the, the kingdom of God, uh, his ways uh, above all else, above my agenda to live righteously, that, that it's the actions of a disciple and the result is that he will give you everything that you need. Not everything that you want, but everything that you need. And that living as a a follower of Jesus means two things. That there's blessing, and there's favor, and there's reward, and there's prize. But it also means sacrifice. That as a disciple, that there there can't be one without the other. See, I love to talk about all the great things of the disciples and that they got to experience. But I also have to be reminded that the first disciples were exiled, killed, imprisoned, and executed. And that was on a good day. See, that we have to understand is that being a disciple of Jesus is losing my plans to his plans. Being a disciple of Jesus is losing my plans to his plans. And, you know, it's it's making his way my priority in how I live my life. See, what does this look like every day? Like, if you kind of think about it, you know, how many guys have ever played the game Would You Rather? You know, like, it's the game. Here's the thing. Girls, you guys are great at this game. You guys have great questions that have deep meaning conversation, like conversation starters. Guys, you suck at this game. You know why? Because you ask questions like this. Would you rather eat ice cream or burn to death? Like, and that's, that's like, that's what you guys want to, that's what you talk about. You guys suck at this game. That's what we do. But, but girls, you're great. But Jesus, he's been playing stuff like, he's been playing this game forever. He's been asking us, would you rather questions what, uh, since the beginning, since his teaching, that he asks us, hey, would you rather serve others in need or would you rather be comfortable and would you rather be and serve yourself? Which way do you step? When Jesus, like Jesus says, would you rather follow me, forgive that person who has, who has uh, hurt you or wronged you, who has done something to you, or would you rather follow your plans, seek revenge? Which way do you lean? Jesus says, would you rather, hey, would you be a person of integrity and not cheat at school? Or would you rather, hey, would you rather lie and justify I'm trying to beat the system so I could be perceived as better? Which way do you lean? I think Jesus says, hey, would you rather follow me and allow me to mold you into my likeness, help you learn to express your anger in appropriate ways? Or would he, or, or he asks, would you rather keep losing your temper Yelling at your friends, siblings, and parents. Which way do you lean? See, because here's what a lot of Christians do. They believe in Jesus until following him messes with their plans. That's not what a disciple does. A disciple lives a way of contrast. They follow the ways of Jesus no matter what our culture says, no matter what media says, no matter what social media says, no matter what your friends say, that a disciple of Jesus obeys Jesus. And that most of the pain and the heartache that I hear about always points back to people choosing their ways over Jesus' ways. When I, chat, when I chat with students, every single time about mistakes, most of the time, majority of the time, always comes back to that they chose to do their own thing 
rather than obey Jesus in the way that he's called them to live. See, lots of the pain that we experience, if we're being honest, stems from us choosing not to live a life of contrast because we don't understand that obeying Jesus is actually worth it. It's not binding at all. It actually uh, allows us to live life and life to the full. And so for many people, when they know Jesus, the shackles of their past mistakes, they get unlocked, but they choose to live with them still. They choose to still walk around as if they're shackled because they truly don't understand that following Jesus is the key to living a shackle-free life. That he actually calls us and, and, and wants us to live and experience life in a way that we'll never ever get, get to experience if we follow the world. But until we begin to follow him and obey him, you won't, well, you'll never experience true joy, never ex- experience true peace, never experience true love that comes along with it. I kind of want to end with this idea. Have you guys ever, I, I had a couple uh, of friends who, they're missionaries in Thailand. And in Thailand, they have like elephants and stuff. They like rode elephants and they do all the elephants. Like elephants is like one of my favorite animals. I got one right here. And uh, they were they're, they're explaining to me that these elephants are literally uh, 6,000 pound animals are held together and don't roam around by just a small rope on their ankle. And here, and I asked them why, and they, and they know the history, and this is what they do. That they make the elephant believe that there's invisible shackles on their ankle that they can't leave. This huge 6,000 pound animal who could literally uproot trees with its trunk is tied by this little rope and stake in the ground. And what I found out is super interesting, and it's kind of sad. It's really sad, actually, is that as a little baby elephant, trainers go and they take the elephant and they clasp a metal clasp around the, the baby elephant's leg. And then they take a big old chain, like one like you probably saw this week, and they wrap it around the clasp, and then they take a big metal stake and they stake it in the ground. And for two weeks, the, the elephant's uh, natural, uh, innate, I don't know, nature comes out. I can't think of the word right now. Instinct, that's the word. The instinct comes out. And he's, he is struggling for two weeks straight, trying to escape, running, and gets tied behind by the shackles. Runs, and then until he hits the shackles, until his, for two weeks, he gets tired, and he lays down, and he's bloody on his leg. And in his mind, he thinks that there is absolutely no escape. Fast forward 10 years, same elephant. 6,000 pounds. All the owners do now is hold a little rope with a stick in the ground because all the elephant needs to do is feel just a little bit of tension and his mind automatically goes back to when he was a baby elephant who's shackled, thinking that he could never, ever get away. He's literally bound by invisible Shackles, And here's the thing. I think the enemy has done a very good job of making us think that we have these shackles around us. That if you claim Jesus, if you begin to obey Jesus, that you will literally see and you will literally feel the shackles that you feel that maybe have binded you, the mistakes that you've made, the guilt and the shame. Yeah, you know the stuff. You know you're forgiven. You know what the cross means, but now you actually get to start to live it. And you will literally feel the shackles that you thought were once holding you down break off of you, and you will begin to experience the life that you were meant to live through Jesus by obeying what he says. See, a lot of you, you might feel like you have like the shackles on right now and that's a little kind of funny because they're little cheap little, little things. But in reality, spiritually, you are living with shackles. You might understand that you're free from sin. You might understand what Jesus has done, but you truly haven't begun to live and obey Jesus because what John is saying here is that if you want to begin to live that kind of life, the life that Jesus calls you to live and tells us about how to live, you have to start obeying what Jesus says. See, when we obey Jesus' commands, it, they don't bind us. They actually begin to free us. That we can actually begin to live a life of contrast. And people will begin to look at you and go, I want that. I want that freedom. 
Because guys, here's the deal. Jesus is worth obeying. He is worth it every single step of the way. You no longer have to live with the shackles. You no longer have to have them and keep them on you. You could walk about, you could walk free from this room tonight. Shackle free. When you first start to take the first step and obey what Jesus says, I'm telling you, it's worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly